discussion of Paths of Glory. Uh, I am joined by Paul Wright of Cabrini University, who uh, made that wonderful introduction that I, I hope all of you saw. Uh, as you know, um, we will be taking questions and comments from you during the discussion. Uh, we would ask you, I would ask you to please keep yourself muted unless you have been called on by me to ask your question or make your comment. When you have a question or comment you wish to make, please use the raise hand function as uh, shown on, currently on the screen. And um, my colleague Jill will also be monitoring the chat. You all are welcome to chat amongst yourselves in the chat, of course, but if there's any sort of you know, prevailing theme or question that keeps coming up, Jill will let me know about those. And we did receive some questions uh, in advance as well uh, over email, uh, which you can do for any of the films we are going to discuss. Just go to Film Studies Online uh, at our website, brynmarfilm.org, and uh, find the Ask Andrew form. That's the easiest way. And you can submit your question that way. Um, in the meantime, we are uh, all ready to go. And I would encourage any of you who has joined us to use the raise hand uh, at the bottom of your uh, box to uh, your Zoom box to try and um, to try and get your uh, question through or out. Um, and uh, that being said, I don't see any hands just yet. So I think we can perhaps start with uh, a question that we got over uh, email that is kind of a good, you know, a bit of a background question. And um, Paul, I'll give you first crack at it, but I can talk about it uh, as well if you like. And that is sort of where Stanley Kubrick is uh, in his career at this point, the uh, director and co-screenwriter of the film. Uh, can you share anything about that with us, Paul? Sure, and, and feel free to build on this. Um, quite simply, um, Kubrick uh, wasn't yet <laughs> the phenomenon that we now remember him to be, um, not in terms of a lengthy filmography, um, those of you who know his career know he started out as a photographer and did a lot of great work for Look Magazine and might have spent a lifetime remaining a photographer and eventually made his way into filmmaking. And aside from a few documentary shorts and short films that he worked on early in his career, really only um, his first major film prior to Paths of Glory is The Killing which is a pretty amazing film to become your calling card. It's one of the best uh, crime films you'll ever see. Um, one of the writers on Paths of Glory, Thompson, uh, also worked on The Killing with Kubrick. So um, really before Paths of Glory, Kubrick has one film that put him on the map. And after that, he would do a little film called Spartacus. Um, you also need to keep in mind that Kubrick's total output in his lifetime given his kind of meticulous and perfecting nature and the years he took to make his films, uh, depending on your account, you're talking about anywhere from 12 to 14 films, that's it. Um, for someone that is argued by many uh, to be the greatest filmmaker of the 20th century. Uh, Andrew, did you wanna add anything to that or? I would just say that as you suggested by your response, his output was certainly um, more regular during the early parts of his career as would make sense based on someone starting out and needing to, to take jobs and things like that. Um, and part of the reason that he did go on to direct Spartacus is that Kirk Douglas was also a star of that film and they needed to replace the original director. And despite his uh, challenging, let's say time working with Kubrick on this film, he, he always said that he respected his talent um, and uh, so he suggested he be hired to make that movie. Uh, yeah, what Paul said is really something that um, for his second film, basically, his second professional film, his second Hollywood film, um, he is, MGM shows sort of such a, a sign of, of faith in him that they're willing to let him uh, kind of handle, um, you know, a, a movie that is not about a topic that is enormously popular in Hollywood, 
uh, World War I and has a tone that is even less popular in Hollywood, which is, uh, let's just say, not happy. Um, but uh, MGM was reluctant, as it would turn out, they were right to be reluctant about the financial uh, upside to this film, figuring that it would be, it would not go over well in some European countries. Uh, and that was true. And that definitely cut down on the box office. And it didn't set the box office world on fire in the US either, despite it being well received by critics, um, you know, almost everywhere it was actually shown. Um, but the fact that Douglas came on board as star and producer um, convinced MGM to go forward with it and, and we're all the luckier for it. Um, I see we do have some questions coming in from people in the discussion, so let's turn to one of those. Um, Janice. So it's Janice and David sitting here together. Hi. And I, I want to really start in some respects with some comments and, and see what everybody else's thoughts were. We finished the film and looked at each other and said, we really didn't like this. And what we really didn't like was most of the people. And yet the more we discussed it, the more we thought the acting and, and the, the minutia on the. Oh. Something happened, David. Yeah, the, the, oh, the there host, you are. There, yeah, the host, the host uh, accidentally muted me. Now it says right. I'm muted again. No, I'm okay. Um, so the the filming was wonderful. The acting, I thought, for the most part, certainly the the top four, five, six characters were were very well done, and and you could see the the grit that went into the the work of making the movie. And yet, as you describe. It's a movie where at the end, there's maybe the one character that you say you like, you have sympathy for at least the three uh, that, that were executed and you hate the entirety of the situation. Um, I think that uh, our, our, uh, our guest's comments ahead of time sort of said some of this, but I'd like to see other people's reactions and uh, uh, invite them and yours. Well, I, I, this is something that's come up before. Um, this came up, I think, with Magnificent Ambersons last week, and it's come up at different times. And um, the, the notion that movies have to be about likable people or leave you at the end with a positive impression is, I will grant you, a widely held one, but it is not a universal one. And it is certainly not what every filmmaker is striving for with his or her movies. And I think the strong... Um, distaste you had for certain characters and certain aspects of this film, I would, I would imagine um, is probably exactly the desired effect um, by, by the filmmakers, um, including Kirk Douglas, who one, gets to play the one likable person, um, but two, um, was as adamant as, as anyone that the um, ending of this film, which is not an uplifting one, uh, be preserved despite some rumblings during production that it were probably, you know, sort of um, uh, false starts, but that that, that might be changed. Uh, Paul, your thoughts on that comment? Yeah, I mean, that's that shows you watched the film, that you um, had that reaction. Um, and it's a pretty typical reaction to a lot of Kubrick's films, which, as I suggested in my introductory remarks, are often viewed as misanthropic or at least as deeply skeptical about human nature and the potential for human good. And so from that point of view, Kubrick has never been interested in giving us likability. Um, if anything, I would say though, that individually there are moments of humor, grace, and certainly humanity for each and every character in this film, even the generals. Um, but at the end of the day, they end up being as unlikable as they are because of the institutions they serve and the institutions to which they sacrifice others. Um, and that really was Kubrick's uh, goal in this film, is to expose the hollowness of all institutions. So uh, I think you know that, that proved its effectiveness if you had that reaction. The scene for me that hammers this home um, far more in a way than the story of the soldiers, as heartbreaking as that is, I think its predictable um, end is pretty clear early on. Um, but the closing scene with the um, German woman being forced to um, sing and entertain uh, the French troops. Uh, one question we got in advance asked um, whether that was even historically accurate. Were the French lines that far 
forward that they would have a German civilian prisoner. I don't think that really matters for the purposes of what Kubrick's trying to do with that closing scene, which is really um, a kind of dualistic scene because it begins with a lot of cruelty. You see the French troops at their worst. The actors Kubrick picks for that scene are filmed in such a way to show humanity at its absolute lowest. And you feel nothing but pity for that poor woman who by the way is uh, Christiane Harlan eventually to become uh, Christiane Kubrick, Kubrick's wife um, for many, many years till he died. Um, imagine uh, the position of that young woman and the degradation she's experiencing. And Kirk Douglas is watching all of that through the window, right? And it seems only to confirm his own deepening misanthropy, his own deepening skepticism about what they're doing there, about the human condition in general. There is a glimmer of hope in that the men are moved enough uh, by their circumstances and by the song to cry a bit at the end, but it hardly makes up for everything else that you've been watching up to that point. And that is how the film closes. And I, and I just to add one thing, I, I think part of um, uh, Dax's reaction at that point is the uncomfortable sensation that perhaps there was a bit of truth to what the generals were saying about the men at one point where they, where they call them scum. Um, at that moment, they were, those men at the beginning when they were of that scene, when they were treating that woman that way, they were not redeeming themselves, uh, mm -hmm. not showing themselves to be as human as we would like to think most of us are. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, at the end, they, they turned a bit of a corner. Uh, let's see, Kathleen, you have a question or comment. Yes. Um, in 1958, when Kubrick made this movie, did he have the option to film it in color? And if so, did he choose artistically to do it in black and white? Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, tech, strictly speaking, the technology to make the film in color existed in 1957. Um, but it honestly would not have been seriously entertained as a consideration or as, a, as an option, um, you know, very much beyond the, probably the first meeting with the producer about it. Um, that would have been more expensive. Uh, at the time, the technology would have required different cameras that would have been larger and more expensive to use and harder to have navigate in a shoot that was in on done all on location in Germany. Um, and frankly, um, members of the uh, German crew and the European crew would have had less experience with color probably than a Hollywood crew would have. So um, it, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been possible. And frankly, the other thing I just thought of is given they're not too many, but there are moments of violence, including some where we see, mm -hmm. we see blood and, and body parts. Uh, that would have been a, a non-starter at that time in Hollywood if it had the vibrancy of the color red uh, to emphasize the gore. I um, liked it in black and white. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. It works. Let's see. Uh, David, you had a question or comment. Uh, yeah, in terms of the color, Kubrick wanted to shoot in color. Um, but it was all budget driven, the decision to go black and white. But I agree. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine the film in color now, you know, but uh, and, and going to a couple of things uh, touched on earlier, um, they got away with literally with murder in, in the end of the movie from the studio because the studio didn't care. About, it was a throwaway movie for them. That it was a sop to Kirk Douglas, so he would do some other work for them. And they had money parked overseas that they couldn't bring back without tax uh, repercussions. So they blew the money on that. Well, that explains why they allowed him to shoot in Germany at a time when location shooting a whole Hollywood feature in America wasn't all that common. Yeah. J Jimmy Harris said that he doesn't think the studio ever read the final version of the script. <laughs> well, I guess if they had, had, you know, like you said, sort of had written it off, it, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Uh, let's see, uh, Barbara, you had a question or comment. Barbara and Richard. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Um, hi, Paul. 
Um, so we had not seen this movie before. I think we found it kind of stunning in its um, kind of brutal honesty. And, you know, we, we happened to have visited some of those areas a couple of years ago when it just was very vivid to us. Just like a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I found that the turn of the men in the um, club at the end with the woman to be a false note. Um, it just, I mean, I didn't expect them to show a, you know, like a gang rape or something, but it, it seemed to happen so quickly. And I, I was puzzled by it. I'm wondering about your reaction to it. But the, the, the other two questions I had was, um, it reminded me a little bit of watching the Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam a few years ago with, you know, these missions to do something that's impossible um, and it doesn't seem to register that it's impossible. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the frustration about that was, was also just sort of palpable. And, and the, um, the one other comment or question was the context of the film. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, being made after Korea is over basically, but before Vietnam has ramped up. Um, it's, w was it the sense that it was okay to show um, the, the, the decadence and the futility and the corruption of what was going on with the so-called leaders of the war because they were foreign and like, was it the idea that like our folks would never have done that or behaved that way, but you know, those are all French you know, or whatever. Um, because it seems to sort of slide into what I remember growing up in as a patriotic envelope of time. And so I'm curious about, you know, getting the movie approved, um, whether there was any controversy about it and, and how in some ways it anticipates the whole slew of movies that emerge in the seventies and eighties and apocalypse now and so on. Well, so, you, so you've got kind of two really good questions there and maybe more, but um, the first one regarding the ending, which I know draws a lot of attention from people for all the reasons we've been getting into. Um, you said that it struck for you a bit of a false note in how quickly all the men turned and we saw their uh, humanity. And, and I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I think I partly agree. Um, there was something Manichaean and dualistic about that um, depiction of human nature because it showed those men both at their worst and in a sense, if not at their best, at least at their most uh, tender and fragile and humane. And whether that works for the viewer or not, I guess depends on the viewer. Um, back to David's earlier comment about the studio maybe not caring that much about this film because it didn't expect much from it. That's probably um, partly how they get away with the ending. Although to the extent the studio was paying attention, um, I think that little grace note or to you false note of the men uh, showing their tenderness and their tears uh, is the one way to kind of mitigate the uh, relentless horror of this film to that point. Um, the film that comes to mind for me, or at least came to mind for me when I was watching it again this time, um, is Kurosawa's Rashomon. So Rashomon is this brutal uh, rape and murder. It's this huge film questioning perspective in the nature of truth. These horrible crimes happen. You have no idea what actually happened. And at the end of the film, there's a kind of framing story wherein um, a monk has an abandoned baby and one of the witnesses to the crimes of the film uh, decides to adopt the baby. And Kurosawa got a lot of flack for that ending. Basically, people said, come on, you had this unrelentingly dark film, and then you have an adoption at the end. That's too easy. And there was something of that here in Paths of Glory, although I think far more restrained and less optimistic in that Kirk Douglas, Colonel Dax, doesn't comment at all. We don't get to you know, hear any narration from him about how human beings actually have some good in them. It's just, they have both in them. They have nightmares in them and they have dreams in them. Um, your second point, and maybe Andrew can speak about this too, um, how was the film received in that sort of post-Korea, pre-Vietnam, at least America's Vietnam context? Um, I think you're right. Americans lived, maybe still live in a kind of patriotic bubble. And if this film were about American combat officers and high command, um, I, I wonder how different their reaction would have been from that of the French, right? So I do think dislocating this story to World War I and focusing it on somebody else's military and their problems 
um, was probably the uh, safety move, right? To shield from, from the kind of criticism that would get the film canceled. Andrew, yeah. did you want to add anything to that? That is a safety move. The fact that it's based on a novel Right. That was, you know, I don't, I, uh, you know, widely acclaimed, maybe too strong, but a, a known novel that was that was respected and appreciated. That had been a shield against censorship and political considerations in Hollywood for decades. I mean, the Grapes of Wrath isn't exactly, you know, the the fuzzy picture of America we think of Hollywood making, but John Ford's film version. Um, and there are f other film versions of Steinbeck novels and Hemingway novels that that are able to go through Hollywood during this general era because they have the the vet the bulletproof vest of being a, a novel. Um, the other thing I would say is this story has the added benefit of having been based or inspired by actual incidents that were mm -hmm. um, reported in the New York Times contemporaneously. So that fact would really if not be true, if not be truly make it a specifically and you know I won't say uniquely, but a specifically French story, um, that it was at least a, a fig leaf that the filmmakers could say this is about an incident that actually happened in a particular army, et cetera, et cetera, and that that would have been um, a, enough of a of a shield. Um, regarding the other point about the ending, uh, you know. I see what people are saying, but I, one thing I have to ask is there comes a point where if you don't have that ending or you have that ending and the scene continue in such a way where all we do is see them being horrible to that woman, then we have to ask ourselves, what did Kirk, what was the point of what Kirk Douglas was doing? And indeed, what was the point of the film? And if you want to say that all humans are terrible, and that's the point of the film, then that would have been the way to do it. But if you would rather say there are differences among people, and just because someone has a different rank or a different sort of station doesn't mean their life is more or less valuable than someone else's, then you have to have the ending the film had. You have to show those people to be human or else much of the point of the rest of the film is lost, or at the very least, it's a different point the film is making. And, and I think, so I, I think it was in a way necessary. Andrew, just in defense of your point here, um, to, to look at it from the other side, having that grace note at the end, if you will, the tenderness of the men, um, it, it, if you're going to defend it, it does remind me of something Kurosawa said in response to the criticisms of Rashomon and that ending with the adoption. Uh, he said, uh, I'm a believer in humanity and I don't apologize for that. Um, so if you want a much darker take on the world than that, you're looking at the wrong filmmaker. Now, Kurosawa and Kubrick are as different as filmmakers can be, but in this one way, the decision uh, by Kubrick, perhaps influenced by commercial considerations, but also at the end of the day, his choice, the decision to put that grace note there in at the end um, to kind of give us something to leave with uh, besides what we've seen for 88 minutes, um, I do think maybe there is a defense of that that Andrew's articulated. Let's see. Uh, Jan, you have a question or comment. Yes. Um, I would just like to say, first of all, John and I reserve Friday nights as movie night. And after this film, while well, we looked at each other and just went, well, that wasn't fun. But war isn't fun. And we appreciated that Greenmark Film suggested this title. I think it exposed us to something we wouldn't otherwise have seen. Um, it gave us a chance to go on our own bunny trail and do a little more investigating about the director, the, the film, the period of time. It was a great learning experience. One of the things that we noticed were some similarities with the movie 1917, which came out, I guess, about a year ago. We, we uh, noticed that, noticed the impossible mission uh, theme and also, you know, the setting, of course. Yeah, uh, Jan, I was smiling when you made your comment because Paul and I were just talking about that movie before the discussion sort of went live. So um, Paul, since that sort of point of observation was initially yours, I'll let you field this one. Yeah, so I haven't seen 1917 yet, it's in my queue. And um, I did ask Andrew what he thought of it because he had seen it. And of course, you know, World War I movies were on our mind just before getting started tonight. And um, he can 
he can articulate better what his um, concerns with that film were. Um, but in short, um, he felt like it hadn't uh, overwhelmed him, maybe even that it underwhelmed him, and that it hadn't really broken that much in the way of new ground, that in some ways it felt to him like a World War II movie rather than a World War I movie, which may have just as much or more to do with filmmaking convention in the early 21st century as much as anything else historical. Um, what I will say, and I know this much about 1917, it's long, um, Kubrick's movie is 88 minutes. And I have to tell you, re-watching it again, it was the most economical film I've seen in a long time. So much is accomplished that another filmmaker would have belabored. And his editor on this film, even though you have to remember Kubrick as the meticulous director he was, would have a kind of final edit. Um, he worked with Ava Kroll, who was a German editor. This is pretty much her only kind of Hollywood production. She had a long career in German uh, film and television. Um, but between the two of them, between Kroll and Kubrick, um, they pared this story down to something that moves so briskly, much more briskly than the novel does, um, and yet says as much or more. And I think that's a real testament to what this film achieves, that so many themes get explored in it that lesser films would take three hours to try to get to and fail to get to. And I don't know, Andrew, to what extent 1917 fits in that category, but um, that, that was sort of the basis of our conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I think you talked about lesser films and I think I, I'm not you know, prejudicing anyone who hasn't seen it by saying that 1917 is a lesser film than this one, but I, I will grant you that still leaves a lot of room. So uh, <laughs> let's move on. Um, Barbara uh, Silverstein, you had a question or comment. You need to unmute yourself, Barbara, if you're there. Okay, we'll come back to you, Barbara. Oh, wait, there you are. Go ahead, Barbara. I was thinking you were, I thought you were controlling that, so never mind. Um, I was saying that I wanted to thank you for presenting this film because I never would have seen it otherwise, and I'm, I'm glad I did. I've always been a fan of Kubrick's, but this is such an interesting way into his oeuvre, if you want to say, but um, I, wanted, I wanted to say, well, gosh, several things, but a lot of things have already been said, but one of the things that really struck me was that um, it, there was a certain herky-jerky quality to, I don't know how to explain what I mean by this, except that the, everybody had horrible, I mean, everybody in the, in the, pic, in the film pretty much did terrible things. Um, Kirk Douglas did mostly better things, but he had some moments as well. But it seemed to me that one of the things that the film was showing is that everybody is a puppet of one sort or another. And that, for example, the scene in the very early on when the two generals are talking uh, with Kirk Douglas there, it, it ha they just, they go from being buddy, buddy to boom, boom, boom without, with, and it all happens so quickly. And at first I thought, boy, this feels really phony. And then I decided that it seemed like that was part of the purpose of the film was to show that everybody was really, no matter who everyone was, nobody was in control. And that it was, and it was because of the the whole background where where all the generals had their own motivations, and they all. I, well, I don't want to go into all that too much because that gets kind of boring. But but that was kind of something that made sense to me. Um, and everybody, including the priest, was being manipulative in one way or another. Um, and I would say that you could even say that about Kirk Douglas, although his manipulations were usually an attempt to try to make things better rather than worse or more selfish. So uh, those are important for me to, to say, because I, I was really, um, oh, oh, and I wanted to ask you, if, I wanted to say something about the ending, the false ending. I, I don't really, I don't think it was, I think it was part of the herky-jerky thing that, that I don't, I don't, I didn't find it um, a false ending, but I do think that it was one way of saying that even these people who had that humanity in them eventually to, you know, join her rather than to continue to attack her, um, that was kind of a saving grace at that point, but it really still was coming from people who'd been pretty crappy before that. So thank you, Barbara. Okay. <laughs> 
thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the I, I think that um, the comments on that latter scene, um, you know, are are in line with a lot of what's been said. And regarding your first comments, um, I, I think you've articulated a way in which this film expresses one of its themes very well, and it's a theme that Paul mentioned um, in his introduction, which is basically that um, you know everybody sort of has someone to answer to, and even the highest ranking general has an institution that, that puts pressure on him and has somebody or some entity to answer to and that it is the rare person and perhaps it is no person who is beyond such considerations. Um, Paul, would you care to uh, add to that at all? Sure, um, I, I think again, the um, comment Barbara is making speaks to a lot of the themes I was trying to develop in that intro um, about institutions rather than just individuals. And it's not that individuals don't matter to Kubrick. They matter a lot. It's just he's most interested at what happens to them in the crucible of in institutions or in the Petri dish of institutions, whatever you want to call it. Um, the idea that um, everyone has someone to answer to, what did Bob Dylan say in that song? Everybody's got to serve somebody, right? Um, that's really important to the film. And it's captured in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing I mentioned in the intro, um, David Simon loves Paths of Glory. It was a huge inspiration to him along with other things for The Wire. And part of the reason for that is in The Wire, you see all these people, some of whom are more decent, noble, or horrible in some cases than other, others, but they're all um, cogs in a machine. And that machine goes on running with or without them, which is not to make moral excuses for anybody. This film is quite the opposite of making excuses for anyone. In fact, that's one of Kirk Douglas's points, right? That we can't make excuses, we have to call things out. But we all feel those pressures. And that's conveyed from the opening scenes of the film. Um, one of the questions in the chat was about the visual style and cinematography of the film. Um, that keys into this theme directly, right? Think of how many scenes in this film, especially in that uh, chateau where the court martial takes place, how many scenes do we have where people are utterly dwarfed by their surroundings? Um, Kubrick was always fixated on 18th century architecture. This comes out most famously in Barry Lyndon, but you also see it at the end of 2001 and in some of his other films. So that obsession with 18th century art and architecture um, is here early on in Paths of Glory. And the way he deploys that space to show um, you know, they're trying to take the anthill. Is that the name they've given it? It was a different name in the book, in fact. I can't remember what, but they're calling it the anthill. Well, who are the ants, right? And how dwarfed are we by circumstances larger than ourselves? That's one of the um, visual elements of the film uh, that, that really stands out. So too do the tracking shots. So fans of Kubrick know that he loves his tracking shots. You see plenty of those here in this film, which is also used to move you quickly through complicated scenes, which could be as different as a ballroom for the high command in the middle of a party, which we see later on in the film, or it could be shots that take you through the trenches and into the utter horrors of war. Uh, let's see, uh, Annette, you have a question or comment. Yeah, I just uh, wanna thank you again for introducing me to this film, which I've never seen before. And I think watching it now, when you know we're questioning a lot of our institutions and, and to just think about the whole idea of being cogs in a wheel and whether there's any way by tapping into our common humanity that we can change that. Um, I thought it was really a profound film. No, it didn't feel good but it was really, really emotionally evocative in the way that I think it was intended to be. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, the, the ending um, made me Google the song um, and it turns out it's a German folk song that the French soldiers may or may not have known, but it reminded me of the story that I know is at least a book and an opera and a folk song about the Christmas Eve armistice of 1914, mm -hmm. um, where the soldiers, the German, French, and I think the English went out and, and it actually kind of celebrated Christmas together. And then um, in John McCutcheon's folk song, he's got this great line that um, 
they then said, whose family have I fixed within my sights, you know, after that brief respite. And then the last line of the song just feels like it's appropriate. Um, I've learned that the ones who call the shots won't be among the dead and lame and on each end of the rifle were the same. So I, I just thought about that ending and I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be that they knew the song or there's something about the humanizing effects of music and art. Um, but, but somehow there's something that that little tiny hopeful note felt really important to me given the bleakness of the rest of the film. I think that's, um, that's a great point. Um, the, the fact that they can, maybe they can't learn the song per se, but those French soldiers can kind of mouth along with it. They can sing it, they get the melody, they get the sentimentality behind it, which is what brings out their own uh, pain and sorrow and tears. Um, the, the kind of healing power of art that you were getting at, even just to heal you for a moment. I mean, it doesn't heal everything, but just for one brief moment, you have a collective shared humanity. I think that's built into this song, which by the way, got repurposed uh, by Vera Lynn, the famous uh, British crooner who just died. Um, so this is a song that had a life um, uh, before and after Paths of Glory, maybe not so much of one today. Um, I did find a translation online of the song, just the first um, few, few lines, not the whole thing. It's called The Faithful Hussar. So it's an old school song about, you know, faithful soldier. Uh, faithful soldier without fear, he loved his girl for a whole year. For one whole year and longer yet, his love for her, he'd never forget. And it's a very kind of simple, sentimental song. Um, but in the moment depicted in the film, that's about, about all anyone can handle. Um, and, and it does have this kind of soothing uh, quality. Whether, whether that works for every viewer or not is another matter. And I, I think the soldiers are just humming. I don't think they're singing the words. I think yeah. they're humming the melody. Yeah, I think you're and, right. And that's something that is a lot more accessible. I, I know the melody of some some countries' national anthems, and I have no idea what the words are. So that's that's something that seems a lot more believable to me, especially for for neighboring countries. Um, we've been getting some questions both in advance and in the chat about the similarities between this film and Doctor Strangelove. They are both obviously films by Kubrick. They are both films that can that show um, inhumanity at different fate or different levels of the military complex. I think. Um, Strange Love is more obviously biting, but it's it's radically different in tone. Um, I also think the liberties that Strange Love takes about uh, it's about America, an American government, an American military, and I think the the br relatively broad satirical nature of it was essential for such criticisms to be you know basically be able to be made um, in America at that time. Um, Paul, did you have any thoughts on the, the uh, only a very simple thought and, and I do appreciate some of the comments in the chat about the use of Vera Lynn at the end of strange love right so the will meet again song and all that. Um, the simple thing I would say is I don't think Kubrick makes strange love without making paths of glory first. I think there is a kind of opening up that happens for him aesthetically artistically, um, but also culturally politically. Uh, that really lays the groundwork for the kind of film that Strange Love will become and for the kind of satire it will indulge in, um, which is for the most part, right, humor absent from this film, a uh, few moments here and there, but this is a very grim film by design. It's meant to be so to honor its source material, honor the war, honor the people involved. But by the time you get to the early 60s and Strange Love, um, there is a no holds barred, you know, take no prisoners kind of Kubrick on the scene that I think had to make his other films first to get to be um, the filmmaker of Strange Love. Uh, that said, right, how many times has Kubrick reinvented himself? This is someone who uh, retooled himself every time out, tried new genres, tried new settings, tried things that no one thought he could do, and of course ended up doing them in a way that no one could forget. Let's see, uh, Richard, you have a question or comment? Uh, yes. Um... I made a number of comments on, on the chat, but what I want to mention is if you, I'd like to compare the scene where the two generals meet, where they have to take the anthill with the scene in Vertigo where Jamie Stewart meets the husband and the husband wants him to follow his wife, the way they move around 
and the way one character manipulates the other character into doing what they want to do. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good observation. I haven't seen Vertigo in a while. I don't remember there being as much physical movement in that scene as there was in Strange Love, but I think the scenes serve a, a similar a similar purpose. And I, I think the um, the movement in the Paths of Glory scene and, and almost a, it's almost a dance, if you mm -hmm. will, um, is is a wonderful way to sort of underscore um, the theme of what's happening and is. Someone earlier talked about how things kind of seemed herky jerky. There were sudden changes, and I think that that the movement in that scene, in a way, kind of smooths over the sudden changes in the dynamic or the ongoing changes in the dynamic between those two officers. The other point I wanted to make was um, I don't know what the movie cost, but every dollar is on the screen. Yeah, it was it was just under a million or so, and about a third of that went to. Um, Kirk Douglas. So, you know, it gives you a sense of what they were working with. And I think you're right. The, the, if the economy of the editing that I mentioned goes hand in hand with the economy of the production, because this film still looks fabulous um, in ways that CGI productions maybe don't. Right. And, and, and that many extras, um, they were German police officers, um, that big of a battlefield scene um, for a second time director without the aid of, of, of post-production computers um, to pull that off as, as effectively as it was, it really is a sign of a, of a skilled craftsperson, absolutely. Um, let's see, uh, Howard, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I do. Um, one of the themes clearly is uh, cowardice on the battlefield in the military. And it's hard not to conclude that the whole trial process of these three soldiers uh, was really a farce that uh, the trial itself was and the ultimate execution. And it's certainly got to be offensive to almost anyone. And I would think anyone, the distaste and the arbitrariness of it. But do you think that the director is saying that uh, under no circumstances should there be any consequences or punishment for a soldier who demonstrates uh, cowardice on the battlefield. So Howard, that's I think a really great and interesting question because it goes well beyond the scope of the film in, in interesting ways, um, getting at military history and tradition. Um, if you're asking me what Kubrick thinks, I think just you know watch Full Metal Jacket again and you'll see what he, really thinks about military institutions. Um, so from that point of view, I don't know that Kubrick believes uh, any of this kind of uh, fighting and any of these military traditions accomplishes much of anything at all. I think to him at the end of the day, it's people fighting over an anthill. That said, going beyond the film, right? Were, were people uh, shot in the past for cowardice and for not marching forward when ordered to? Absolutely. This is a long standing option uh, for officers, particularly at the colonel and general level. Um, maybe not so much today where we would be a little more taken aback at that decision, but in the past and even in World War I, um, these things did happen. I think what is so outrageous about the story, which is based on real events, is not just that they decide to make some examples out of the men, right? They, they want initially, the general played by George McCready wants to kill 100, and then they whittle it down to three, like one from each company. Um, and we kind of know they're doomed, right? And it's already a farce, like you said, these guys are, are gonna end up dead. But what really sticks out, at least for me, is how they get selected, right? One gets selected by lots, the Joe Turkle soldier, who turns out to have actually fought and really has no reason to be there other than he has bad luck. You have another um, who is being punished by someone uh, because the soldier who's picked, right, in quotation marks, knows the crime committed by the other, right? Early on, they go out on a patrol and Roger throws a grenade, kills his own fellow soldier by accident um, and doesn't want anyone to punish him for that later. So he basically takes his old school rival. It seems they had been in school together before the war and pins the, the you know, the responsibility for not 
marching forward on him. So in one case, it's a raw deal to punish someone for something else totally unrelated to the act of cowardice in question. For another guy, he's picked totally randomly. And the third, we're told, played by Tim Carey, the excellent um, and very bizarre actor who had been in Kubrick's The Killing prior to Paths of Glory, we're told he is um, a social undesirable, whatever that means. And I think that's what really sticks with me at least, right? It's already absurd enough that these guys are being punished for what is questionably, you know, an act of cowardice. Um, but they are also being selected with no rhyme or reason, or sometimes in the case of very base personal motives of revenge. Um, if you just look at that, how do you walk away and say our institutions are sound and that we're better than the other guys on the other sides of other side of no man's land? That's, I think, some of the deep cynicism of the film. I'd, I'd actually take one um, one issue with with the question Howard posed or his his premise. Um, I think this movie is much more about cowardice off the battlefield. I think it's about people, um, soldiers or not, soldiers who ever get near the front line or don't. It's about the things that aren't about the actual fighting. It's about the tough decisions. And you made this point in your introduction to an extent, Paul, that this is about institutions. This isn't just about the military. This isn't just about war. This is about institutions and people's reluctance to face the music when they make a mistake and how they get shielded, um, the sort of random decisions that are made that can sort of rot an institution from the inside out, um, those sorts of things. And I think the, the biggest examples of cowardice, I agree, it's questionable whether those men in those companies, you know, were guilty of what they were being accused of. But remember, the man who was supposed to lead them had already been established as being a, um, you know, a, a weak person, certainly a moral coward, if not a, if not a wartime one. I mean, I don't mean Dax. I mean, the, the, the one who he puts in charge of the firing squad. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I, I think it is about cowardice, but I think it's about more than, uh, than cowardice as it relates to war, which was part of your point in your introduction, Paul. And, and as one of the commenters in the chat just pointed out, uh, McCready, the general, right? He orders artillery to fire on his own men. So talking about who's the coward, who's the war criminal here, right. uh, it seems much clearer in his case than in anyone else's. Yeah. Uh, Faiza, you had a question or comment. Um, yes, good evening. Um, I generally avoid war, war films at all costs. Um, and I'm glad I saw this one on uh, Paul Wright's recommendation and Andrew's recommendation. I thought it was a very good one for all the reasons that you mentioned. I thought the economy, um, in other words, alerting us, pointing us to the horror of the individual belief systems as well as um, institutions that advocate for um, and um, and um, fight wars was, was the real horror. I didn't need to see so much blood and gore. And I had read somewhere that the directorial decision to make this in black and white was somewhat also related to the fact that this is a gray and grim world. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a technicolor world. It's, it's, a, it's a very down and depressing wor world in every way. And I really liked what Andrew said about cowardice off the battlefield. That's more poignant. I mean, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have the other, obviously. And I thought the ending in particular was ingenious because how else in one scene to showcase the fact that our understanding of horror is inextricably related to our sense of humanity so he did that really with one scene by showcasing it at the very end. And I thought that was very effective because, you know, otherwise we can't understand anything if we're just swimming in it all the time. But by contrasting that uh, with our other parts, I thought I was left um, really more horrified in some way. So I am really glad I saw this film. Thank you. You know, to your, to your great point here about um, why it works in black and white, I just sent everyone a link to an image of one of the early um, movie posters for Paths of Glory. If you just click this link, you'll feel like, oh my God, this is nowhere near the same movie. Um, it's all in color, right? This kind of bombastic, you know, let's go to a war film kind of color. Uh, never has the screen thrust so deeply into the guts of war is the tagline with the word bombshell next to it. 
Um, and so to your point that you were just making, right, the, the marketing aside, right, which was going for a very different kind of audience, the film itself embraces the bleakness of it all because that's part of its point. And I wonder how disappointed some of the audience might have been if they'd come to the movie solely on the basis of that poster. Uh, let's see, uh, Lisa, you had a question or comment. Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I also want to, uh, I'm very grateful for having watched this. My father who uh, died recently, this was one of his very favorite films and um, I never watched it before. So I really welcomed that. Uh, at the opening of the film, I had a few fears. Uh, one was that it would be very much like 1917 and the whole uh, the whole film would be on the battleground. And the other that occurred to me early on is that, wow, we're, we might not see a single female in this entire film. And I thought it very telling that uh, when the female, uh, the woman finally appears at the end, other than the, those dancing with their, um, with their husbands and their general husbands and so forth, uh, she stirred in them uh, their sense of, of humanity and family and compassion. And uh, I, I thought that was very significant. I, I think they were reminded of their their own wives, their own mothers, their own sons and daughters. Uh, but I, I was uh, hoping to see some role of a female. I gave up on that. And then uh, I, I thought it, it really was um, uh, very um, important that it was a female. Also that, that she brought in music and uh, that music touches the soul in a way that uh, they, they had lost contact with. Well, thank you for sharing those comments, Lisa. Um, let's see, uh, Dana, you had a question or comment. I kind of want to come back to the, the scenes with the three soldiers who were um, on trial. And I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I saw the film before because we saw it in a class, Andrew, with, it, with you, Andrew, I saw it. And so I had the luxury of being able to look for different things. And one of the things that struck me in that in the scenes with the three soldiers on trial and then really throughout was the differences in the types of acting, uh, which is always very intriguing to me personally in this movie. There, there wasn't a common denominator in terms of the type of acting here. And it's really shown clearly in those three soldiers because as each one came up to testify in the court, they were very unique characters and they played them very differently. And I think Carrie, the, the character that you were talking about, that the, the, the crazy strange guy, um, he had a completely different take on the, the way to act in this film than anybody else did. And it was really interesting to, to think about how different people portray different things. As much as it's, it may be about a theme, because of that, I saw these as very, very separate characters and separate people, not just a whole world of soldiers. And it, 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 it was, for me, for me, part of the, the joy of seeing this film for the second time. Well, thanks for saying that, Dana. And I, I think that, um, you know, I, I viewed them as very different characters. I didn't, I, I don't have the same sort of, you know, experience uh, you do to be able to just make that a distinction of acting style, but I could certainly see differences among them. And I, I think the fact that this economical film that covers so much ground in such a short time spends so much time with those men after they are condemned um, is a testament that the film is trying to make some of the points that you you were saying it, it made, Dana. So I, I think you're right on about that. Um, Paul, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, just um, I am always drawn to those three actors. Um, it's uh, Ralph, I believe Ralph Meeker and uh, Joe Turkle, as I said, and Tim Carey. And I think you're right. They are each approaching uh, the character in very different ways, which works, right? Because each of them has very different and kind of wildly shifting, in some cases, reactions to their fate. And so it's very fitting, right, that they not be cookie cutter extras who just are there to get shot at the end of the film. Um, you know, as much as Kirk Douglas, you know, I'm sure had an ego like any other big time Hollywood actor and producer, right, and had a producing 
role in this film and definitely wanted it to be a showcase for himself. Um, he nonetheless, I think, was a bit brave in giving so much screen time to a lot of other people in this film, uh, including uh, the generals and, and other characters, and also in playing a hero, but we'll put hero in quotation marks, who fails, a hero who doesn't get anyone out of their predicament. There is no last minute reprieve. And instead, those three poor souls go down. Um, the scene that always bothers me and curdles my stomach is when uh, George McCready's general, after the men are dead, says the men died very well. And we didn't have anyone who made a scene, which on the one hand is absurd, right? Because you have one guy, Joe Turkle, who's so wounded that he's not even really conscious for his own execution. You have Tim Carey's character crying and sobbing and he doesn't run, but he's about to run, it feels like. And so I don't see how that doesn't cause a scene. And then even the Ralph Meeker character who's very composed at the end and doesn't really accept the apology of Roger but at least hears it, right? Because Roger comes up and says, I'm sorry that I put you in this position. He was calm by the end, but before that, you might remember, he too was bawling and crying on the ground to the priest. Um, so all these actors have kind of put their mark on those roles. And that I think makes the film as memorable as anything a lead like Kirk Douglas can do. Paul, I don't want you to give Kirk Douglas too much credit because <laughs> Um, my understanding is Colonel Dax has a much bigger role in the film than he does in the novel. That uh, is true. <laughs> and, that uh, is true. He's, he's not France's greatest defense lawyer or criminal lawyer right. in the novel. Yeah. And I don't know that he leads the charge twice in yep. the novel either. Um, and of course, Kirk Douglas somehow finds a way to have his shirt off in a World War I trench bunker. So what um, we all know that today the film would be starring Tom Cruise, is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, who would also may, may have a contractual obligation to remove his shirt too, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Lillian, you had a question or comment. Okay, um, I wanted to talk about um, the communications guys who refused the general's order to mm -hmm. fire on his own men. Yeah, the artillery officers, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and then reported him afterwards. Um, it was a very kind of small thing that happened in between, but at least the general got some comeuppance because of that. And that sort of, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna follow the rules, you follow all the rules and sometimes that leads to problems for people. So to your point, the, um, I think there's bravery on the part of the artillery officers who are putting themselves at risk. Um, I mean, they're, morally they're doing the right thing by disobeying that order. It is morally and ethically wrong. Um, that said, reporting it takes some courage after the fact. And they do set up a kind of downfall for George McCready's general. What I find fascinating though is Adolf Manjou's general, the general who kind of started the whole thing going uh, it started the ball rolling um, by asking McCready to take the anthill, right? He uses the testimony of those artillery officers, which in other circumstances, he probably would have just buried. He probably would have punished them and made sure their reports never came out. But by that point, he's done with McCready and he knows somebody down the road is going to hear about what happened here. And somebody down the road has to be the fall guy. And that's McCready. And McCready knows it by the end. He realizes he's been played. And the one thing Adolf Manjou's general can't understand, right, is how Kirk Douglas as Dax wasn't angling for this all along so that he could replace McCready in his command. And Dax says, you're crazy. I don't want your command to hell with you. And that doesn't compute. Like you will almost see Adolf Manjou's head and mustache and all the rest blow up because he can't um, process the idea of a guy who isn't acting out of self-interest to get ahead within the institution. Um, Barbara and Richard Hirsch, did you have another question or comment? Um, yeah, and I just want to know if you would comment on the role of the priest, both in the context of the film and in the context of the time, because an attack on the institution of religion you know, wasn't always so popular either. And I thought that character was complexly drawn, unlike the priests in a lot of film noirs who sort of like nod gravely, you know, at the execution scene with Jimmy Cagney or something. Um, 
this guy, you know, seemed both to be caught in the situation in which there was little he could do, but but also did not seem particularly defensible in the platitudes that he was mouthing and in his complicity. So I'm just curious about um, if that was a new direction, you know, in terms of just the institution of religion in this context. Um, I think your observations sum up his sort of role and his position very well. I, I think what I would say um, before turning it over to Paul is that, um, you know, uh, if this is a film about how institutions sort of get their claws into people and often put them in untenable situations, I think both the military and the church put that priest in a, in a very, very difficult situation. Sort of it's his, his, occup his whole occupation is a sort of extremely difficult situation. Um, Paul. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I think while we don't spend as much time with the priest as we do with others, um, there may be a kind of sideswipe <laughs> uh, at the institution of the church in the film. I don't know. Um, but only to the extent that like anybody else, as Andrew was pointing out so rightly, that priest is caught in a web of demands and expectations that are much larger than he is. I think he has... Um, a few moments that are grace moments in the film, if you will, uh, pardon the pun. Um, and, and there's also a moment that makes me really annoyed with him. Um, the grace moment, at least for me, is when Joe Turkle kind of loses it in captivity and starts yelling at the priest for spouting out the platitudes and wants to hit him. And then Ralph Meeker hits him back so hard that it causes the head wound that perhaps uh, by the grace of God causes Joe Turkle to not be conscious for his own execution. Um, when that happens, the priest seems to show no rancor, um, no vengefulness. He seems to understand why that young man is so upset and lashes out at him. So I think that's a nice moment. But at the end, when Tim Carey's soldier is being escorted to be shot, um, he says some things that are just kind of garden variety, uh, gallows platitudes. Um, but then at one point he says, my son, you should not question the will of God. And on one level, I, I get theologically where that's coming from. You could apply that to anything. But from Kubrick's point of view, you can hear Kubrick saying, right, this was not the will of God. Everything that happened in this movie was the will of men and human beings. And they need to own that. And to displace that onto God right now is as much an obscenity as anything else in the film. Well said. Uh, Richard Chait, did you have another question or comment? No. Okay. Uh, Dana, what about you? Nope, sorry. No, Hands no, down. Pro no problem. Um, and I'll just see if I can go zero for three. Uh, David, did you have another comment? All right, I am 0 for three. Well, uh, no, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay, go ahead. I got the microphone again. I, I have a bunch, but I'll just stick to a couple of things I heard, you know, the. The thing, the scene with the three soldiers in the, with the priest and that whole part you guys were just discussing. Well, I should preface this by saying this movie, which I saw about 15 years ago for the first time, really just grabbed me by the throat and shook me. So, so the, the three soldiers, the thing that amazes me about that scene, and I'm not giving Kubrick or the writers uh, full credit on this because they're, they're very similar to how the characters are drawn in the book. You know, they really don't, you know, the three soldiers, they don't really depart too far beyond what the actors do with the roles themselves. And the fact that um, one of them is like this peasant who's like in the beginning of that scene, like kneeling, praying at bed, like, like a child at bedtime, right? Totally into God, you know, asking God. And then you've got Paris, who's like this somewhere in between. It's almost like the, the whole history of Western, the attitude toward religion and Western culture is shown in those three guys. Mm -hmm. And and so you go from the peasant believing God to the guy who's like hedging his bets, doesn't quite buy God, but okay, I'll, 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 I'll confess. And then defending him against the cynical, skeptical, totally analytical uh, Arnaud. Yeah, they um, run the gamut. They you know, the and the fact that the sin, the, the scene begins with the opium of faith and ends with an injection of morphine. 
<laughs> it, it, it blew me away. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah. Um, this, uh, this movie is in incredibly impactful uh, for a lot of people. And uh, the number of people who uh, have said that they saw it for the first time um, because of this discussion and are glad that they did, I'm, I'm very gratified by that. I, I think it's a, an extremely powerful film. And I have to say, I'm, this is probably obvious at this point, but I, was, I am shocked every time I see it how contemporary it seems and they are not mm -hmm. i love 19 a lot of 1950s movies but i cannot say that very many of them at all seem like they could have been made last year or last week or 10 years ago or 60 years ago and and this one does and i think that says something one of Paul, things, any last kirk, thoughts one of the things kirk douglas to your point andrew one of the things he said about the film was sometimes you make a movie you don't really know what it is and maybe it takes 50 years for it to be appreciated um, I know this is good. Um, I don't think it'll make money. Now he also said that, but I know it's good and I know it's worth doing. And, and I think that speaks to the, um, the timeliness and timelessness of it, which is also sadly a reflection of the timeliness and timelessness of war and conflict. Uh, but the film, I agree with you, um, in this one important way hasn't aged a bit. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Paul, thank you for suggesting the film and for your thoughtful insights, both in the introduction and tonight in our discussion. Uh, we do this pretty much every Monday and you can find out what next Monday's film will be and get a link to that uh, co-moderator's introduction by signing up for our weekly emails. We send out an email every Thursday with the following Monday's movie. So see what's coming up next week. Uh, visit BrynMarFilm.org to sign up for emails. Check out the new movies we have available for streaming and your streaming uh, rentals help support Bryn Mawr Film Institute until we are open again. Uh, you can check that out in Theater 5. Um, if you like these education uh, programs on Monday nights, there are some others that we do that are a bit more in depth. Uh, you can look for those and other film related things at film studies, uh, the Film Studies Online section of BrynMarFilm.org. And uh, we can't wait until we're able to show a movie and have a discussion again uh, with us, everyone in person in the theater. But until then, uh, we hope to see you on Monday nights for these discussions that you help make so interesting and lively. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good, good night. Good night, thanks. <laughs>